important because it reminds all of us in the church how much we can learn from those who are younger than us, especially those who are at the beginning of their youth or their adult life and have energy and creativity and inspiration and have a vision for how they want to live and how they want the world to be that might challenge us. This instruction comes from Paul, who is an older mentor, to Timothy, who's a young pastor just beginning his career in leading the early church. And Paul challenges Timothy to be bold in claiming his own value and his own worthiness and the role he can play in leading the church even as a very young man. So as we listen to this verse this morning, we hear Paul say to the next generation, including you, our high school graduates, but also our young adults, you are just as important and just as worthy of respect as those who have been around much longer. You are not less than because you are younger than. As Paul says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Paul goes a step further, though, to challenge young people in the church. You who are younger, you have something to teach and demonstrate to believers of all ages. You are not passive in your role in the church. The youth and young adults of our congregation have an opportunity to be an example to all of us in how they talk and how they live and how they look at the world and see the situations we are in and how they love everyone around them and how they lean into their faith in God in the midst of the challenging situations we are living through. Let's be honest for a moment and notice that Paul flips on its head the assumption that dominates this congregation and many other churches like ours. And the assumption is this, making sure that the youth are respectful and appreciative of the older generation who built this church and brought it up and that they would learn from their example. Now hear me, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think the youth and young adults of this church give great respect and seek to learn and appreciate all that the older generation has done for them. The scholarship is a great example of that, but also the support, the mentoring. People in this church take our, our youth and young adults fishing. They take them and they show them how to serve in places like Mexico or San Francisco or even in direct ways to serve here in Central Oregon. But what Paul is challenging us to see is that this respect goes both ways. It's not just about the younger people of the church respecting an older generation. It's about all generations of the church looking at those who are young in their lives and saying, there is something I can learn from your example and from your experiences of faith, but also your experiences in the world right now. It must go both ways. You see, Paul levels the playing field in this instruction to Timothy. And here challenges the older generation to go the other direction, to look at those younger than ourselves and to say, we can learn from them. They have something to teach us. So here's part of the sermon that is for the older generation of our church. How is God leading us to respect and appreciate the younger people in our congregation? And how can we go beyond ourselves and perhaps our, our preconceived ideas about the next generation to follow their example of Christian faith, of love, of standing up and speaking out for justice and Christian living in our world? How can we learn from the young people in our church? But how can we also look beyond the walls of our church and learn from the young people in our nation at this moment who are at the front lines of this fight for racial justice, the young people of the world who are at the very front of the movement to stop the worst effects of climate change, the young people in our country, including in our town and in this church, who have stood up to speak out and say that they want safe schools so that when they return to school in the fall, they will not be worried about the threat of gun violence in their schools. Part of looking to the younger generation is seeing that their experience is different than ours. Before working at this church, I led a college ministry in which most of the students were 10 to 15 years younger than myself, exactly one generation. And their experiences of the world were so different. 
the first president they really interacted with as teens and young adults was a black man. They grew up in a time when they were never not afraid that a school shooting could happen because Columbine happened in 1996 when I was in high school. The youth and young adults of today have never not lived in a world where climate change was a serious threat. And now they're out front leading this movement for racial justice. We can look at that, see an example, and respect their experiences as young people, but especially as people of faith, young adults of faith who are showing us what it looks like to follow Jesus today. So high school seniors and all the rest of the youth and young adults of this church, hear this clearly from me as your pastor. I see you. I recognize your value in our church. I respect how you understand God and faith and life differently than me because your life is different than mine. I want to interact with you enough via online mediums for now, in person soon, that I can learn from you and follow your leadership and example. And my desire for all of us as a church is that we could say the same thing to our young people. We see you. We see the challenges up against you right now in this moment. The challenges of a rapidly cl uh, changing climate, the challenges of gun violence in schools, the challenges of racial injustice, and we see your desire to learn how to live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ today. We want to learn from you and see you as an example. This is a challenge for all of us as a church. To you young people, who will you become in the months and years that will shape who you are becoming? Who will you become by God's grace? And for all of us, as we look to a younger generation, we have to be willing to change how we see the world. And who will we become by following their example in faith, in life, in, in their Christian discipleship? Who is God leading us to be? Now, I also want to read another section of scripture that speaks to this particular moment for our high school seniors, but really to all of us. And it's from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It's just an interesting part of wisdom we find in the Old Testament that I think just targets this moment we are in right now. Ecclesiastes 7, 8 to 14. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. The patient in spirit are better than the proud in spirit. Do not be quick to anger, for anger lodges in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is as good as an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to one who possesses it. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what God has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other so that mortals may not find out anything that will come after them. These six or seven verses are just packed with wisdom about how to live faithfully as the people of God in this very challenging moment we're in, and especially in this moment of transition that our high school uh, seniors, recent graduates, are encountering. And I especially love that line in verse 13. Who can make straight what God has made crooked? If you had any plans these last three months, and if you saw them as a linear path, from February through to high school graduation, or whatever else your plans were for your job or your family or your retirement, everything has changed these last three months. Whatever straight line you made in your plans has been made crooked. And we're not blaming God for that. Well, the wisdom of the teacher in Ecclesiastes here is to say that God doesn't work according to our straight and linear plans. The world we live in is so much more complex than that. And the God who is king over creation and king over our lives works through the very crooked paths that our lives take. And God teaches us today, keep walking down those crooked paths. Don't try to shortcut and circumvent the challenges of life, but look around you and notice how God is at work and with you even in the midst of unplanned circumstances and challenges. 
Personally, I've had our high school seniors close to mind and in my prayers these last three months because I think of how their life has just been turned upside down by the pandemic. I grieve with what you have lost your senior year, the sports seasons, the dances, and now a very different graduation than you imagined. You will never get those back. But at the same time, you are showing us what it means to be resilient, strong in character, and creative with how you shape your own life as you now move from high school into college and into your young adult life. I'm also aware for you high school seniors how uncertain the near future feels. Just this week, more colleges and universities announced that their plans for the fall will look different than previous years. Some of it will be completely online, some of it will be in a hybrid format, but there's no question that your college education beginning in September will look different than what it looked like for last year's freshmen. We are also in this time of radical social and institutional change. And the fact is your graduating class enters a world that is being remade, rebuilt. And you will play a role in that. And that's exciting and life-giving to just think about. So into this unique moment of change and upheaval and uprising in our world, I want to listen to the wisdom of God's word that we see in Ecclesiastes 7, this ancient wisdom I'm just going to highlight a couple of verses. Every one of these verses could be a full sermon. But in verse 8, the wisdom teacher, Coalette, says this, Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, so be patient in spirit. These past months have taught us a lot about patience. But for you high school seniors, you have demonstrated incredible patience, not knowing, waiting to hear what will graduation look like, what will classes look like, what will college look like. As you look back over these past three months, I hope that you see how you have grown to endure challenges, to take on unforeseen circumstances. But also this weekend after your graduation, I hope you can look back four years and agree with the wisdom teacher that the end of a thing is better than its beginning. As you have now graduated high school, look back and see how you have changed and grown and developed into who you are now. Who you are now is a more real version than who you were at 14. You've endured tough things. I know some of your stories. You are not as innocent as you were four years ago. You are more mature, more self-aware, and more fully yourself. We celebrate who you are becoming. And we look ahead to college this next fall that will be new and challenging, it always is, but especially so this year. So keep this wisdom with you as you begin a new thing. And this is a reminder for all of us as we begin new ways of being together in coming months. Doing anything the first time is frustrating and hard, sometimes really hard. But you are up for the challenge. And you have years to learn and grow and develop to explore who you will become. And four or five years from now, at the end of your college experience, I pray you can look back and say, yes, that was hard, especially at the beginning. But I am so glad for who I have become now in my early 20s. As the wisdom teacher says, the end of a thing is better than the beginning. We go through challenges in life, and God doesn't throw hard things at us capriciously to make us better people. But when we encounter challenges, we look inside of ourselves and we look around us and say, who is God leading me to become through this? And by the grace of God, may I be a better person, a more faithful follower of Jesus at the end of this hard thing than at the beginning. The next bit of wisdom I want to reflect on is from verse 10. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Do not say, why were the former things better, former days better than these? Now I know that most 18 year olds looking ahead from high school into their college years have optimism that life is on a trajectory of expansion and improvement. And I hope the challenges of these last three months haven't squelched that optimism for you. Your whole life is open in front of you and it can and will be full of good and beautiful things. And it will also include challenges. So this verse is really a caution to keep in mind years or decades from now. And a word of caution to the rest of us further along in life. 
Do not say, why were the former days, years, decades better than these? The wisdom teacher of Ecclesiastes here says that we have nothing to gain by looking to the back, looking back to the past, and wishing that the ways of the past were the ways into the future. Because there's no way that can be our reality. We live today and tomorrow we will live tomorrow, but we cannot go back to relive yesterday. Nostalgia is a normal part of being human, and there's nothing wrong with pulling out pictures and remembering good times with family and friends in the past. But nostalgia is a not great tool for shaping our future. It doesn't do the job. We all wish we could return to some carefree moment in our past, either our childhood or adolescence or our young adult life. But life can only be lived in one direction, and that's from the present to the future, valuing and learning from our past but not seeking to repeat it. That is true for each one of our lives. That is true for us as a church in this moment of change, and that is true for our nation. This idea of not looking back and saying, why were the former days better than the, these is an especially challenging message for us as a whole church in this pivot moment of transformation that we are in. Hopefully, in a matter of weeks, we will gather again to worship and have meetings here, but it will be so different. But it's not just about the fact that we will be uh, socially distanced or wearing masks or doing things different on a technical way. The reality is, and I encourage you to wrestle with this, the world has changed in these last three months. And the world has changed again in these last two weeks as a national and a global movement for racial justice has arisen. The world is changing as I speak and it will continue to change. That's just the world we live in. Now let me say this, graciously, it is not a sin to look back and appreciate the way things once were, but there's no wisdom in trying to live life in reverse. And this, I think we all have something to learn from our young adults, our youth, our recent graduates in this congregation. How can we live looking through their eyes at the future in front of them, having a positive orientation to the change that is immediately in front of them, and the transformation that's happening in their own lives in the world around us. That is a way of wisdom for all of us. To say, how can we imagine a better world, a more just world, a world where we have a role to play in the shalom that God wants for all of creation? And finally, I want us to reflect on this verse 13 that I pointed to a few minutes ago. Consider the work of God. Who has made straight what God has made crooked. We could chew on this verse for a long time. As I've said in these last three months, we've been reminded over and over and over again that life does not go according to plan. And if somehow you knew this was going to happen, it still would have surprised you endlessly. We might aim to get from point A to point B in our lives on a straight line, but that's not what ends up happening. Life happens on crooked and winding paths. Or maybe the reality is that God reveals to us that our plans are always too simple, too straightforward, and God meets us and encounters us on the winding, crooked path that life actually takes us on. No one knew before March that you would be finishing high school at home or walking across a graduation stage with a mask on. But here you are, you did it. You rose to the challenge, you stuck to it, you overcame your frustration, and you graduated. You are showing us the value of resiliency. For all of us, though, life does not go according to plans. And this verse reminds us that that isn't a bad thing. That's not a problem. It might be a neutral thing, but it can also be a good thing. Are we ready to adopt a flexible spirit? that recognizes that the life we live will take us places we never imagined, will reveal to us things about who God is and who we are that we never thought we would learn, that the life we live will put us in relationships with people that are so valuable, that we're so glad we followed that crooked path and ended up walking next to them. 
The reality is life is more beautiful and more fulfilling, more rich, because it is complex, because it is unpredictable, because it is surprising. You see, on sunny and peaceful days, God is certainly at work. In times of plenty and of want, God is at work. But also on stormy, rainy, hailing, snowing days, God is at work. When you feel like you are on the path and you know the destination is near, God is at work. When you feel lost in the woods and have no clue how to get back to a path that will take you forward, God is at work. In times of great gain and in times of great loss, God is at work. You see, the wisdom of Ecclesiastes 7 is that it is not for us to straighten out the path as if to pull on a rope to make it straight. It is to recognize that there is no way to go through life except walking on the crooked path that life will take us down. And to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, is with gratitude in our hearts to notice that God walks with us on the crooked path. It's not like God's will is that we would walk in a straight line. No, God's will is that we would keep walking in the unforeseen, unpredictable, surprising moments of life that all of us have endured our whole lives, but especially these last three months. My primary way of understanding our Christian faith is through the picture of discipleship. When Jesus walked this earth, he picked 12 young men, probably about 18 years old, and also some other men and women ended up joining his movement, and they followed him. And it was not a linear journey. It was not an easy journey. They ended up facing great persecution, watching their leader and teacher die. But they followed after Jesus on that crooked path. They saw him love who was then thought to be unlovable. They saw him include those who were then excluded. They saw him feed the hungry, forgive the sinner, and raise the dead to life. And they walked with Jesus on the crooked path to the cross and then the empty grave. And for every one of us, we have been called to leave our fishing nets behind, to leave behind our plans for the rest of our life, to stay on the Sea of Galilee and do what our parents and grandparents did, and to stand up, leave our plans behind, and follow Jesus. Wherever the path will lead, it is not linear or straightforward. It will be crooked and challenging and surprising and unforeseen. We can't see too far in front of us. But we walk the crooked path with faith and trust in the God who created us and the God who loves us and the God who leads us. We are on this journey together. We have all canceled endless amounts of plans and flights and hotel reservations and parties and other things in recent months. We all learned how to do school from home, work from home, family reunions from home, birthdays from home. This spring has been a season for all of us that feels like a very crooked path. It is not ours to straighten it out. It is ours to keep walking one step at a time, the journey in front of us, with full confidence that God is with us every step of the way. Amen. Let us pray.